Okay, so if we are on time, we are uh, this. Um, I'm very glad to be the chairman presenter of uh, the first uh, invited lecture in this uh, new version of uh, Fluidos 2021 uh, in virtual form. Um, so it's, it's my pleasure, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce to, to the audience to Professor Howard Stone. And I want to to say and to read a bit uh, some lines of his uh, CV or of his uh, life as a uh, as a researcher uh, for the audience. Uh, I know that many people uh, here in the audience uh, have read, have heard about Howard Stone, but. Uh, uh, I want to, to read this, some lines of, of his uh, of his uh, life as a researcher. So he presently, Professor Stone is a professor and chair of the Department of Man Mechanical and Engineering. Hello, yes, yes. Uh, in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences in Princeton University, in New Jersey. Um, he received the Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering from the University of California, Davis, in 1982, and the PhD of Chemical Engineering from Caltech in 1988. After his postdoctoral career in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge, in 1989, he joined the faculty of the now School of Engineering and Applied Science at Harvard University. Uh, just to go a bit faster, in 2000, he was named a Harvard College professor for his contribution to undergraduate education. In July 2009, he moved to Princeton, where he's a Donald R. Dixon 69 and NCW Dixon professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Uh, besides, Professor Stone is a fellow of the American Physical Society, He's past chair of the Division of Fluid Mechanics of the APS and is currently on the editorial or advisor boards of Physical Review of Fluids, Langmuir, Philosophical Transaction of the Royal Society, and Soft Matter. And he's also co editor of the Soft Matter book series. Professor Stone is the first recipient of the GK Bachelor Prize in Fluid Dynamics. He was also aware, which was aware. Uh, award awarded uh, in August 2008, and the 2016 recipient of the Fluid Dynamics Prize of the APS. Javier, okay, how about we stop now? Okay, so, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, let me introduce to you to Dr. Uh, Howard Stone. He will present a lecture entitled Short Stories in Fluid Mechanics. Intersections of thin film, self similarity, elasticity, and viscoelasticity. So, um, uh, the microphone is yours, Howard. Javier, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to Sebastian and your colleagues for the opportunity to uh, talk to you today. It's uh, disappointing one can't do this in person, but hopefully, uh, this is better than uh, nothing. Uh, I assume you can hear me. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I'm going to tell you a, 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 a set of sh uh, short stories in fluid mechanics. And of course, as many of us know, the, the work we do is due to the research of, of uh, the colleagues in our group. And, and this uh, photograph was taken of my group and their significant others uh, shortly before the pandemic caused. Uh, so many of us to uh, spend time away from each other. So I have a few slides uh, just to begin with. If some of you will have seen it, some wouldn't, but just uh, some some themes that I think are why fluid mechanics is fascinating. And then I have three short stories, one about self-similarity, one that combines elasticity and fluid mechanics, and the last is a very recent work we've been doing revisiting some viscoelastic fluid flow problems. And I don't have time to tell you really the details of any of these, but I think I can hit some of the high points and then I'm always happy to, to meet afterwards and discuss. So, um, you know, fluid mechanics is, is interesting for so many reasons that everyone in the audience knows, um, but here's something that perhaps is, uh, you might not have seen before. If you uh, look at bacteria under a microscope, 
uh, you will frequently see uh, movies of swimming bacteria, but, but many bacteria adhere to substrates, and the small dots here are one micron dimension Pseudomonas aeruginosa bacterium. And in a microfluidic device, which is shown in the upper left where my cursor is, uh, you might expect that when there's a flow, they influence the bacteria in some way. And in, in fact, the flow in this video I'm about to play, the flow will go from the top of the page to the bottom of the page. So you expect a shear stress to act on the bacterium, on any individual bacterium. But when you play the video, what you see is the bacteria are actually moving, but which way are they moving? Maybe someone in the audience can speak up. Which way do you see the uh, bacteria moving when the flow is top to bottom? You are now They're going up. Yeah, well, the bacteria go opposite the flow direction. So that's something my, my group investigated. We were, in fact, uh, as far as we can tell, the second group to make this observation. And, and we tried to then, over a couple papers, provide a, a mechanistic understanding of the interplay of fluid flow, which in this case is orienting the bacterium, and a, a motility mechanism the bacterium have when they're, when they're on a surface. And that leads to this upstream migration. Um, this is a very different length scale. It's a shore bird that lives in shallow water. It doesn't really like to get its head wet, so when it's hungry, uh, it spins in circles. By, by spinning in circles, it creates a fluid flow that allows it to eat material near the surface. And if you've never seen this video, uh, it, it's really amazing. And uh, a photograph of the, the dye in, in water shows that the, the shore bird makes a vortex, and associated uh, with, the vor with the vortex near a free surface is an upflow. So by spinning in circles, the bacteria, the, uh, the shorebird is bringing uh, food and organic matter up to the surface that it can and then uh, eat. And so it's a wonderful example of the shorebird bird having evolved mechanisms that manipulate fluid motion. And finally, I'll just leave you with this. If you uh, are uh, at home and having uh, coffee and like to make a, a, a coffee latte, so co coffee and milk, if you have a hot glass of milk and you add uh, coffee to it, as shown by these three photographs, uh, you might expect, or you might see that in the third image where my pointer is, there are horizontal strata in the fluid that have evolved. I learned about this problem from an email I received from someone who had observed this and said he had been asking a number of people. So we decided to do these controlled experiments in the lab with a hot glass of milk. It's hot, so it's cooling horizontally, but when you add coffee sufficiently fast, the flow is very mixed up. But over time, there's a natural instability associated with density gradients in the flow. And I don't know whether you can see this where you are in Argentina, but the fluid then adopts horizontal strata. It has a pattern forming feature that's equivalent to what's normally studied in oceanography, uh, double diffusive convection. And so we've looked at that with experiments and simulations, but again, a very different kind of problem, but one that leads to pattern formation. Okay, and, and finally, I'll just say for the last year, I've been looking at, uh, with some colleagues, Monetary and Simon Mendez and some people from my group, at um, fluid problems inspired by uh, the COVID pandemic where, where air you exhale might be carrying a virus. So we've done imaging of uh, speech patterns. Here, uh, a, there's a speaker just to the right. It's Hardy. He's standing adjacent to a laser sheet that is uh, showing white wherever uh, fog droplets, which are in the room, intersect the laser sheet. And the speaker says, uh, Peter Piper picked a peck. And uh, when he does that, the P's, these plosive sounds, are effectively like vortexes being um, produced as you speak. You can see the time in the upper left. Uh, and over a period of about two seconds, these vortices travel nearly the horizontal distance, which is a meter. And so you can see that um, speech itself, the little studied for flow reasons, more studied for acoustics reasons, provides um, very dramatic uh, air flows in, in front of us, even though we don't see them. And uh, there's a, a video but uh, that we did numerical simulations also to try to study this and showed that these features 
are very similar to just ordinary turbulent jets, even though when you speak, the input is a time, time varying uh, flow. Okay, so those are my short introductions. I'm happy to talk about any of it offline with you. But I want to begin with one short story which might remind many of you of something you either learn in class or teach. And that is the concept of self-similarity. And we've uh, uh, run across an unusual form of it. If you have to uh, tell someone about self-similarity, you might show them similar triangles to, to, to talk through the ideas of self-similarity. But if you uh, are in fluid mechanics, uh, maybe a, a very standard problem you might teach is a diffusion problem. I should uh, say at the bottom of the slide are two very nice references on self-similarity in fluid mechanics, one by Milton Van Dyke and one by Ivar Graton. And uh, they both have a, a wide range of examples and very nicely written if you, if you haven't seen them and are looking for references. But back to the diffusion problem. The ordinary diffusion problem you teach here is illustrated by the linear diffusion equation for a, a concentration C where C is some number C, C naught at X equals zero, say a rigid boundary. And then uh, there's nothing in the domain uh, to the right. If you were to sketch the concentration profile, which you might do for students, you'd make the sketch on the left. And uh, then you would try to convince students that the only length scale is square root of dt. So you can imagine scaling all lengths by square root of dt. And then you claim that all these curves become one universal curve. And if you were to do this, you'd say that you started with a partial differential equation in two variables and you reduced it to an ordinary differential equation in one variable. I'm going to summarize this on the next slide, but to su su suffice it to say, if you're inter interested, I'm, not, I'm going to show you a problem with three variables that, again, you can reduce to an ordinary differential equation, one variable, which I think is rather unusual. So in fluid mechanics, there are not only linear diffusion-like problems, but nonlinear diffusion equations, as I've sketched on the right. Those of you in the audience that study thin, thin film flows will recognize equations of this type. And uh, many of these nonlinear diffusion-like problems admit similarity solutions where C is a function of X and T is, can be written as T to a power alpha times a function of a similarity variable eta, where eta itself is the ratio of X to T to the beta. And often, uh, dimensional inspection of the PDE allows you to determine alpha and beta, at least so long as you're given some other constraint or initial or boundary condition. If, you're, if you succeed in this, then the nonlinear partial differential equation becomes a nonlinear ordinary differential equation, which you can generally solve at least numerically, and it's ideal if you can compare with experiments. So, so the, the feature on the left is part of many problems in the fluid mechanics literature and the physics literature also. The question I, uh, I'm going to ask is, what if you have a PDE in three variables? I'm going to motivate it actually by an experiment. And I'm going to ask whether there's, there's a similarity solution to this problem and uh, show you that it, it can be reduced to a nonlinear ODE, which when solved um, will, uh, will compare with experiments. So the, the new feature on the right is, is a physical problem starting with three independent variables. Now, uh, if you're in the fluid mechanics field, you might have seen thin film equations before. They go something like this. Uh, U is the velocity field. Uh, it's incompressible, so the divergence of U is zero. And you want to solve the Navier-Stokes equations for a, a constant density fluid with viscosity mu. Uh, if a geometry is long and narrow, which you're familiar with perhaps for some lubrication problems, or when you spread a liquid into a very thin film, where the film thickness profile will be noted H as a function of the um, position vector in the plane X, then a geometry can be referred to as long and narrow if a dimensionless parameter, effectively dimensionless, the gradient of H is small. And in that case, the continuity equation can be written as an evolution equation for H, where you need to find the velocity that I've denoted U perpendicular, which is the velocity in, the, in, in, in a plane parallel to the geometry. And you get an equation for U perpendicular by returning to the Navier-Stokes equations and assuming that the flow is a low Reynolds number flow, which is often good when the 
uh, film is thin. And, and then you can effectively use Darcy's law to replace the viscous term by a term proportional to the velocity in the plane u sub perpendicular divided by h squared. And uh, when you include the fact that the pressure can be determined as a hydrostatic variation, if you arrive at a, a, a partial differential equation for the height profile h, here shown for a problem that has viscosity mu on the left, surface tension gamma, and the gravity term rho g enters two different terms depending on the inclination alpha of the substrate. So uh, this nonlinear equation is it's in the literature. People have uh, looked at it in a wide number of cases. And, and I'm going to return to it in a second when I show you the experiment on the next slide. So a uh, well-known problem that is a nice uh, exercise for a class, if you like, is no, goes back to Harold Jeffries, who studied the uh, drainage on a vertical plate, as shown on the left, where the film profile H varies with position along the plate. You know, imagine the plate starts with a uniform coating of liquid, say, because you place it horizontally. Then you move it vertically and you watch it drain due to gravity. And Jeffrey noted that the thin film equation for this case, if you neglect surface tension, is the nonlinear first order PDE shown on the slide. But it has a structure that if you look at the dimensions, you can sort of recognize that the square of H is looking like X over T. And Jeffries then analytically found the similarity solution shown on the right, on the bottom of the slide, which I'll denote H sub J for Jeffries, which involves the viscosity times X in the numerator, rho G times time in the denominator, and the solution is the square root of all that. I'll be using that after. So we did the following experiment, and, and maybe you can help me here. So if you're paying attention, I want you to watch this experiment. Uh, many people have studied the Jeffrey problem, which is studying the film profile or film thickness as measured with a die in the middle of the film. But you might ask, what's special about this video? What strikes you unusual or interesting about this video? And maybe I'll stop and hope someone speaks up. Someone from the audience? What is that? Someone from the audience, not me? Yeah, sure, someone from the audience. We'll see if anyone's awake. <laughs> or paying attention for not reading their email. You are now it's, unmuted. It's, it's thin and in the middle. It's yeah, it's different in the middle. It looks very uniform in the middle. And what else? And and then you have uh, something like a the, the wetting from the la the from the sides, yeah, left from the, the, from the, from the top, wetting from the top, and you have a structure forming at the edge. Yes. And in fact, it was this structure forming at the edge that got us very interested. So in the middle, I'm going to show you that. Uh, the solution looks like the Jeffrey solution. Many people have studied that. But you can do different kinds of imaging of the film thickness, either, either using the dye intensity to determine film thickness, which is kind of sketched at the bottom of the slide, or you can um, uh, do interferometry. And we were most interested in these edge regions, which have highlighted now on the left, where the film thickness is clearly different than the middle, and also varies in the vertical. So this film profile near the edge varies with horizontal dimension, vertical dimension, and time. So it involves three variables. OK, so one can do interferometry to measure the uh, film thickness. Interferometry lets you reconstruct the film thickness by essentially counting fringes. And uh, the uh, distance between fringes is proportional to the wavelength of light. So you can reconstruct film thickness. So this is what we then did. Given this uh, interferometric measure, which we could measure film thickness, we looked at in the middle of the film where we expect the Jeffrey solution to be valid. We looked at three different locations X, and we measured film profiles versus time. So on this graph, there are six different film profiles uh, in the middle of the film, three positions and two different viscosities. So six profiles. Now, Jeffrey said the solution should be uh, the solution shown at the top of the slide. And if you rescale the film thickness by the Jeffrey solution, then all those profiles collapse to one universal profile, which is just telling you that in the middle of the film, the similarity solution, the well-known similarity solution, is an excellent approximation to the film thickness. 
On the other hand, the interferometry shows the film thickness is very different near the edge where the um, contours get curved very rapidly. So we started to then look near the edge. And, and here's what the data looks like. If you pick one vertical position X and scan in the horizontal position Y, you can construct the film profile at a given position. You can do this for two different positions. So now you have three solution curves. And you can do it for two different fluid viscosities and three different times. So there are 12 profiles shown on this graph. And we were interested in what sense might these curves all be the same curve. OK, so um, we went about thinking about this by returning to the thin film equation. And the thin film equation is, is shown on the slide, which is in the fluid mechanics literature. But most people only study it for two-dimensional problems. In some sense, this is a three-dimensional problem. So uh, our, our plate is vertical. And so because our plate is vertical, we uh, can neglect one term. And the, then because all the gradients happen near the edge, uh, all the gradients, the largest gradients are happening in the horizontal direction, which is y, rather than slow variations, which happen in the vertical direction, x. So you can simplify the surface tension term. And when you're done with that, then you only have three terms left in the PDE. They're shown here. There's a viscous term, a surface tension term, and a gravitational drainage term. The first and the last term are the Jeffrey solution. But it turns out you might start to notice that because the surface tension term involves different powers of H and different powers of the independent variable Y, it turns out you can choose a scaling that retains the surface tension term. And the way that works is you recall the Jeffrey solution. And what we noticed was that if you seek a solution for the film thickness as a function of x, y, and t, by writing the Jeffrey solution times a function of an independent variable eta, which is a product of all three variables, x, y, and t. You can choose alpha and beta so that the nonlinear PDE is still satisfied. All the terms are retained. The similarity variable in involves all three physical variables, gamma, mu, and rho. It involves all three independent variables, x, y, and t. And the nonlinear PDE is converted to a nonlinear ODE that you can for example, solve numerically if you make an ansatz for the boundary condition at the edge. And to see how this works, I'll remind you, I just showed you data for the film thickness profile uh, for two different fluid viscosities, three different times, and three different x's, so 12 data sets. And the claim was that there's a the thin film solution suggests an analytical solution uh, if you plotted h versus eta when scaling film thickness by the Jeffrey solution. And that data collapse is shown on this slide. It's not perfect, but I think you'll agree it's, it's pretty good that the, the rescaling collapses almost all the data, where the similarity variable is on the horizontal and the vertical variable is the scale film thickness. And the numerical solution of the uh, nonlinear ODE, or even a, an approximate solution that's based on a linearized ODE, leads to a, a very good representation of the solution. Uh, that's roughly my, my story. You can, you can probe different features of this if you're really interested. You can look at the maximum film thickness, which corresponds to a given value that I'm circling A to naught. And um, you can uh, take that and try to uh, ask if you studied film thickness versus time, for example, what would the um, trajectory of the maximum film heights be? And that's shown here, the, the lo horizontal location, why not, which uh, corresponds to a maximum film height versus time is shown for the 12 different data curves uh, here, five, or may maybe it's more, more actually, it's five different viscosities and three different positions. And if you rescale looking for the, the power law indicated in the Jeff in our, our similarity solution, um, the data collapses pretty well. There's a small vertical offset, but the time dependence is in remarkably good agreement with what comes from the thin film description. Anyways, that's my short story. Um, I'm having to talk offline. It's, it's one of the few examples I know of uh, similarity with three independent variables. Uh, while writing up our work, we ran across uh, a gravity-dominated paper by uh, Stephen Wilson's group in Strathclyde and one of his former students, Yitam, uh, in a somewhat different theoretical paper 
identified a solution very similar to the one we've shown. So there are one or two other examples you could look for. Anyways, that's my short story. I'm uh, happy to answer questions now, but uh, I think I was told it might be better to just uh, go through my talk for another 20 minutes and then have the last 15 minutes or 10 minutes for questions. So mm -hmm. it's up to the uh, Javier, but I'm happy to keep talking or take some questions if there's some in the chat. If there is someone, uh, I don't see anybody in the, the chat uh, or hand raised. So I think it's better if you just go on and wait for the, the end of your talk for the okay. question. Okay, so the next um, project is uh, involves elasticity and fluid mechanics. It's a, a work done by my former postdoc, Bhargav Varalabandi, who's now at UC Irvine in mechanical engineering. Naomi Oppenheimer, who's a postdoc with me and is now uh, in the physics department at, in Tel Aviv, and uh, Mata Ben Zion. So I got interested a few years ago in trying to find problems in fluid mechanics that would help teach me more about elasticity. And we stumbled on the idea of combining a gravity current, which is probably very well known to many in the audience, uh, with uh, the Euler-Bernoulli Bernoulli problem showing the deflection of a beam. And shown on the left is an experiment in side view on top and top view on the bottom, where a gravity current flows over a soft beam and the beam bends as it's loaded. And as it bends, the flow goes faster. So this is a, an example uh, coupling uh, the gravity current motion, which is well studied in fluid mechanics, with uh, beam bending, and they, they, they're tied together. So they're, you, you've coupled nonlinear problems. And if the beam is sufficiently soft, then as the beam is loaded, it can rapidly uh, bend towards the vertical, which then speeds up the um, gravity current more. And so you can also study very large deflections. Mm -hmm. And I studied this with Hyung Soo Kim uh, and the experiments in Peter Howell, uh, uh, theoretically, and we have a couple papers describing this coupling. Um, but today, what I'd like to show you is uh, a somewhat different problem. And I want to remind you about one feature of low Reynolds number flow. Um, I told you one feature in the first part on thin films. Here's a slightly different feature. So if you start with the Navier-Stokes equations for an incompressible flow and you neglect the inertia term, you, you need to, I wish you to recall that the right-hand side, which is a balance of pressure gradients and viscous terms, can be written as the divergence of a stress. So the, the low Reynolds number flow problem is always the divergence of a stress is zero and the divergence of a velocity is zero. And the structure of this then sometimes allows you to solve problems um, in some sense without ever determining a velocity field. And I'm going to give you an example of that here. So uh, we were motivated to look at sedimentation of a sphere, shown as a black dot, adjacent to a plane. And if the plane is rigid, and it's a vertical rigid plane, then uh, a sphere will sediment parallel to gravity and maintain always the same separation distance with the rigid plane. It wrote, the sphere will rotate, but it can't change its separation distance. That's a, a theoretical fact that's consistent with the low Reynolds number flow problem. Uh, in the experiments, I'm going to show you the viscosity is very high, much larger than that of water. And uh, the experiment we're going to do is shown here. There's a vertical plane, but it's no longer rigid. It's soft. It's an elastic sheet shown by the green line. The white dotted line is just telling you what the vertical is. And if you drop a, sh a sphere adjacent to the elastic sheet, then it deforms the sheet. And in deforming the sheet, the sphere drifts to the right. And we were interested in characterizing this coupling of uh, vertical motion, sheet deflection, and horizontal deflection of the particle. And the standard way I think most people would think you have to approach this problem, which is certainly true for a large number of cases, is, is direct numerical simulation because the, there's a fluid motion and there's a sheet deformation and they're both complicated and they're coupled. Um, instead, what I'm going to try to suggest is there's one limit that we were able to determine the drift speed of the sphere in some sense without ever determining the velocity field associated with this flow problem. And it uses 
uh, a feature of what's called the reciprocal theorem, which, I've, which you haven't seen. I just want to um, find a hint at this for you. Now, uh, we're going to uh, show you that the, the drift depends on the size of the particle, as this movie kind of gives evidence for. We want to account for the deformation of the sheet. You could see that that was taking place. And we're going to assume that the sphere is close to the uh, sheet, which again allows us to take some advantage of lubrication theory. And what we're going to eventually find is that we can find a formula for the drift speed of the sphere, which we can compare with our experiments. Um, but the formula will uh, require one integration, but it will never require determining the velocity field. So the reciprocal theorem you might have seen in some form in a class in partial differential equations or acoustics or something like that. Um, uh, the acoustics story you would have heard says that if you have a source at A and a receiver at B, that's the same thing as the source at B and the receiver as at A. And when you study that, that's something that's called reciprocity in acoustics. There's um, the, the demonstration of this is based on Green's second theorem, which is a relative to what I'm telling you about for uh, Stokes equations. And I will say there, there are uses of Green's second theorem analogous to what I'm going to show you today, which no one's ever done for whatever reason. They think it only helps you with this form of reciprocity, but there are other uses of it. Uh, this reciprocity idea has been used in aerodynamics already 70 years ago. And if you read the introduction of the paper on the slide, it turns out it's very similar to the introduction that's often written in low Reynolds number flow problems even today. And uh, low Reynolds number ver flow version, I'm going to tell you, uh, goes back in recent era to Andy Akrabos and company, um, which built on work in the Russian mathematical literature by Ladizinskaya. But the original uh, observation and the original idea goes back to uh, Henrik Lorenz, the great physicist, uh, already at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. And there are analogs in elasticity as well. So this is a kind of problem that's fun because you get to learn about lots of things. And the early ideas that go back even before Rayleigh. And perhaps I think I first learned this as a young professor when I uh, met the late Howard Brenner. And he used to give talks with the title, Getting Something for Nothing. And hopefully this example will try to illustrate why, why he, he would choose that title. So the reciprocal theorem goes like this. The top line is a flow problem you want to solve. You want to determine u and sigma if possible. And you assume that in the same flow domain, uh, you, you know a solution to one problem, which I've indicated with a hat, u hat and sigma hat. You assume that you know those fields because it's a different boundary value problem. And a problem involving a sphere, which has a surface S sub P, would, indicated on the right. The force on the sphere, remember, is always the integral of n dot the stress tensor. So the reciprocal theorem relates two different flow problems. One, u and sigma that you do not know the solution of. One, u hat and sigma hat, which you know. This is effectively Green's second theorem applied to the low Reynolds number flow problem. It's an exact statement. Um, and, and the integrals are over surfaces, which are all bounding surfaces of a flow problem. Now, the small miracle is, if you're only interested in the motion of the sphere, the sphere has a constant velocity. You want to determine what that velocity is. It has a vertical component, and the horizontal component is what interests us. So if you apply the reciprocal theorem to this flow problem, you're left only with two integrals. One is over uh, the integral of the sphere, S sub P, and one is over an integral on the planar wall. I've called it S wall where I've also taken advantage of doing a little Taylor series expansion of the velocity field and stress field in the neighborhood of a slightly deformed wall. If you now just apply boundary conditions, the velocity on the sphere is constant. It comes outside the integral sign. And what's left over is the integral of a stress that you, of a problem you know. That's, so that's a force that you can look up in a book. And on the right side is an integral of a stress, but you look that up in a book for a problem you know. And you only need to know then what's left, which is the velocity on the wall. But you get that by the sort of perturbation expansion of a weakly deformed wall. And the result is that you have a, a formula for the, uh, putting these facts together, for the constant speed of the sphere. 
and you've never solved any new flow problem. You've only looked up things in a book. And when you uh, couple all this together, you get one integral over the plane, the vertical plane, and that integral involves the tension and bending which set the shape of the elastic sheet. Um, now, we, we did that for this flow problem, and uh, we calculated the drift velocity, which is only the velocity perpendicular to the wall, and we did it as a function of all the parameters in the problem, and the results are shown on this slide. I didn't show you the final integral that we had to calculate numerically. Uh, uh, yeah, Javier. No, 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 just uh, I, want to, I was curious how you calculate and you did it numerically, you said. That's, uh, that was my so the final, yeah, the final integral you do, which has a kernel where you know everything about, you have to compute that uh, numerically. That's shown uh, by the solid curve on this graph. The symbols are all experiments. The vertical axis is a scaled velocity, and the horizontal axis involves the tension in the sheet, which you know because it's falling under hanging under gravity, uh, the bending modulus of the sheet B, which you measure, A, which is the radius of the sphere, and H is the separation distance of the sphere from the plane. So everything in this uh, figure, all the axes uh, are known except for the measured speed V perpendicular. Uh, there are two asymptotes that you can get, but the black line, which is our, new, our sort of reciprocal theorem integral, you have to do that, a one-dimensional integral numerically. So anyways, th so this shows that this reciprocal theorem idea uh, is successful. It, it uh, allows you to effectively build in dimensional analysis and, and capture all the physical parameters. And it um, is in very good agreement with a, a wide range of experiments. And if you want to know more about the reciprocal theorem, uh, with my colleague Hassan Masood, we've written a very long uh, review article, which might um, interest some people. Mm -hmm. So that's my uh, second short story. Uh, the, the obvious question about the integral, uh, you'd have to look at the paper to get the details okay. of that. But, but, the, uh, but the principle, I think, is really quite general, and I'm happy to talk about that more generally. Uh, can, I, can I make a question here? Uh, yeah, please. This, um, the x axis is just a proportional to h, which is the separation between the sphere and the sheet. Yeah. So you, you, each, each point is a different experiment here? Uh, uh, the, so, the, the velocity perpendicular varies so, with h. So as the sphere falls, its, it's h changes. And ah, so you can track that. OK, h is the uh, vertical coordinate as the sphere falls down. No, h is the horizontal coordinate. It's, it's separation distance changes. So, what, what is the variable in, on the uh, uh, x-axis? What is what? The variable. What are you varying in the experiments? So you are so measuring in the, the experiment, in the experiment in and the then you are varying... The particle radius can change, the fluid ah. viscosity can change, the bending modulus of the sheet can okay. change, and also where you start the sphere. But the main variable we change, the easiest variable to change, is the radius of the sphere. And the radius of the sphere. Hey. A remarkable feature of this, but it, part of it's tied to the mass of the sphere, is that the, there's a typical velocity shown on the right, v star, which varies as the, the okay. sixth power of a. Okay, I see. I see. Yeah, and but this uh, the other feature about your question, which I I stayed I, I I might have said in passing, but the theory only works when the sphere radius and the separation distance are in the lubrication limit. So the, the separation distance has to be small compared to the radius to use the, the, the model that we constructed for uh, this data. OK, so the, the, the sphere is almost touching the sheet. Yeah. Now you can, you, can, you can do this for any separation distance, but then you have to uh, have a more complicated kernel that goes into your integral equation. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the last thing I'll just tell you about is very recent work I've been doing with a, a postdoc of Genny Boyko, and it's uh, some things we've been thinking about for the past year, and we're, we've revisited some flow problems involving viscoelastic fluids. And this will be short, but um, we're sort of kind of taking a step back, and you might think this is everything I'm going to tell you is done, but I'm going to start with the following thing. Viscoelastic fluids are very common, 
And here's a quote from the 1990s from a man named David Boger. He writes, research in non-Newtonian fluid mechanics has been characterized by the theoretical types, he writes the left wing, who make predictions that cannot be observed by the experimental types, he writes the right wing. And on the other hand, who make observations that, oh, cannot be observed. And by the experimental types, on the other hand, who make observations that no one can predict. So he's basically saying theorists calculate things that no one observes, experimentalists make measurements, and no one can predict them. Now, he goes on and says that non-Newtonian, oh, and he, I should say the part that Evgeny and I like the most is the left-wing, right-wing characterization of fluid mechanics. So he goes on to say non-Newtonian fluid mecha mechanics have been concerned with the development of constitutive equations for such materials, viscoelastic fluids. Unfortunately, he writes, this idealized program in rheology and non-Newtonian fluid mechanics has not been successful in defining a universally applicable constitutive equation. And our assessment is, at least for some problems, very little has changed today. And I'll say what I mean by that. There are lots of papers that are written, but um, there seems to be, if you're interested in comparing experiment and theory, something fundamental that uh, is often left out. So I'm going to revisit something that you will think is in textbooks. Steady state, flow rate, pressure drop relations. Something that you would think should be there, um, but we're going to ask about it for viscoelastic fluids in geometries with shape change or spatially varying geometries. We've done this with analysis and numerical simulations, and I should say our goal is to point out where experiment and theory differ as a means to trying to ask what do you have to correct in the constitutive law to better compare with the experiment and we have some thoughts on that to point out to you what's in the literature and where these uh, differences come here's a typical geometry that's studied in the flow it's a, a contraction flow with flow left to right people measure pressure drop versus flow rate the flow rate is often reported as the deborah number Q is the flow rate in this definition, and lambda is the relaxation time of the fluid. And typical measurements of a, here a dimensionless flow rate where the pressure drop has been scaled by the flow rate versus the flow rate or the Deborah number shows that in experiments, you get this increase in a dimensionless pressure drop. Um, this is pretty robust. If you look at other experiments shown on this slide, the pressure drop increases with flow rate. Um, and the pressure drop when normalized by the flow rate will increase slightly with flow rate. On the other hand, if you go to simulations and plot the dimensionless pressure drop, which is pressure drop normalized by flow rate versus the flow rate or the Deborah number, the, the published simulations uh, decrease, which is opposite what I showed you in the experiments. And it's not just uh, this paper, it's universal in the literature. Um, whether you use what's common, which is here called the old Roy B model, which is kind of motivated based on polymer solutions, or extensions of it called the Feeney model, or in some sense the Feeney CR model, which pu puts in a, a form of um, finite resistance. Uh, so overall, yeah, I should say what you find in these simulation slides is a trend that is qualitatively opposite the experiments when you plot it in a similar way. Uh, so I'll just uh, summarize that here, that uh, for whatever reason, people haven't paid a lot of attention to this, that the pressure drop uh, and flow rate, when, when plotted in some dimensionless way, have opposite behavior in these cases. The old Roy B model gets some parts of it right, but generally not the trend as I've shown here. And so we were wondering, uh, why not revisit the old Roy B model, try to understand what it gets right and what it gets wrong, and then take all these, take suggestions people have made in the literature for improving the old Roy B model and try to determine which you should include in simulations to agree with experiments. I'll skip this slide in the interest of time. And for the theorists in the audience, this is what we've tried to do. We wanted to consider an arbitrary shape. Okay, it's not an abrupt shape. It's a slowly varying shape. 
but all the features we have look like the abrupt shape. Uh, it has a, a, a shape that you'll, you'll specify. We've done 2D problems and axisymmetric problems, and we're looking for the pressure drop flow rate relation for a steady flow. Uh, you want to solve a low Reynolds number flow problem. So again, it's divergence stress is zero. But now the stress tensor sigma has to include something viscoelastic. And that's represented by this parameter A, which is normally viewed as a conformation parameter of a polymer solution. And so the, the, the quantity A depends on the flow field and its gradients. And uh, we'll choose a, a law for A. So we've tried to first make general developments using lubrication spirit and the reciprocal theorem and then uh, do this. And so uh, the first thing to notice is you have to make this problem dimensionless. So I'll just end on the last three slides with this. You choose normal lubrication scaling. So we did nothing different here. But now if you want to include a polymer solution, you have to scale this uh, polymer term A, which is telling you the conformation of the polymer. Um, a few papers have done it this way. Um, most don't. We chose a scaling so that you retain the entire divergence of the uh, polymer term. So when you write the lubrication equations shown in the middle of the slide on the bottom, the terms shown in black are the Newtonian fluid. The divergence of the stress terms you now retain completely uh, in this formulation. And then for a given choice of A, I want to determine the pressure drop. And we figured out how to do that using lubrication theory coupled with the reciprocal theorem. And the result is shown sort of messily on this slide, shows that we can calculate a pressure drop delta P. There are some integrals you have to do, but they only involve this quantity A with a subscript zero, which just means the conformation you would predict if you only knew the Newtonian flow field that's stretching polymers. And there's a term that involves the shape of the uh, uh, geometry, which is the function capital H. And a, a consequence of this is you can calculate the pressure drop flow rate relation for any Debra number sufficiently small, any viscosity ratio called beta, and any shape of the channel denoted by H. And we've compared this with numerical simulations on the following slides. I pointed out to you already that numerical simulations don't agree with experiments, but we're now able to uh, do theory where we can show that one, the theory agrees with the simulation, so in some sense you don't have to do simulations anymore, you can just use our theory. And two, it starts to give you insight for what terms in the theory are uh, helping uh, put you in the direction of the experiments versus not. So I realize that was sort of terse, but it, maybe it gives you the idea of what we've been trying to do over the last year, uh, revisiting a well-known uh, problem for which there was very little analysis, by the way, and lots of simulations. Well, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave you. I've told you some uh, short stories. Um, I hope you found a little of it interesting, and I'm happy to answer any questions. OK, thank you very much, Howard. Um, so. Uh, this is very interesting what you have told us. Um, I'd like to know, I'd like to take some questions just written in the chat or if someone wants to open um, microphones for the questions. Can I just ask, how do I see the chat? Uh, there is on the, on the left, uh, there is public chat, public chat. Oh, public chat, I see. Yes, okay. and then uh, we should see something written from, from the audience there. Okay, well, so far we don't see anything, so... Yeah, yes. Maybe, maybe um, I should put a question in the... Maybe I should put a question in the chat. Uh, there is a raised hand here by... Uh, two, Sebastian. I see that? Sebastian uh, and Victor. Um, well, so I should give them... Um, I don't know how to do it. Sebastian, can you help me here? You are now... Oh, just... You, you can name the person that should ask. Yeah, you. okay. Is, I think that Victor has a question. You are now muted. You can speak, Victor, if you have your microphone open. Victor? He raised hand. I click on his hand, but uh, I don't get anything. This is the... You are now muted. Uh, 
now. Okay, what should I do? I just, uh, just click on Victor. Victor, you can. I did that or you did that? Enable your microphone, Victor. He hasn't enabled the microphone. Victor, can you can you write something so, your, so I can tell that question to, to Howard? You are now muted. Oh, uh, I don't know. You are now unmuted. Victor, you can post the question on the public chat if you can't enable your microphone. Uh, I think that Alejandro is writing something too. Um, that's what I'm seeing. Uh, uh, Victor also, I think that there are a lot of people typing. <coughs> we have to wait for the their comments to arrive. Hello, Javier. Gaston is talking. Gaston Miña. Ah, Gaston. Sí, estoy haciendo algo mal. I would like to know how the length of the polymer influences in this kind of experiment when you have the, the compression experiment here. That's, that's the... So the question the last, is... On the last the... Set, sorry. In the last set of experiment, the length of the polymer on the viscoelastic experiment, how does it influence in, in the results? So in, in the formulation that we've done so far, we did... It's a great question. The length of the polymer doesn't enter directly the old Roy B model alone. It enters the model when you have this so-called Feeney correction, which which says that polymers can't infinitely extend, but they have a finite length. So we've done a little work uh, trying now to, to use our approximate approach to include that. I'll, but as soon as you do that, there's uh, sort of two parameters that get introduced by the Feeney model, and we haven't probed that. What I can say is I mentioned this disagreement between uh, experiment and, th and simulations. The simulations with the Feeney model do not fix the disagreement with experiment. It's a very natural thing to conclude to include and it's why it's widely done in simulations as far as I can tell because polymers have a finite length and so they'll resist. But all we can say is when you go back and start to ask of all the terms you that plausibly can be included in a constitutive law. The Feeney term is very plausible. It does some good things. It does not rescue the disagreement that I mentioned between pressure drop and flow rate simulation to experiment. And so we're on the hunt for something else. We're sort of have an idea of what that is. But the Feeney term, although plausible and probably the most studied thing in simulations, um, does some good things. It doesn't rescue this disagreement. Does that help? Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Thanks. Uh, you, but perhaps, however, you can see the questions from Sebastian oh, I, I, and also from Alejandro in the chat. Or do you want me to read them? Oh, what is the known solution? Oh, so in the sphere flexible sheet case, you make the following, uh, use the following idea for like reciprocal like things. You say, I'm interested in the drift of the sphere away from the flexible plane. So the model problem that you look up in a book is a rigid plane with a sphere moving normal to the plane. That was first worked out by Howard Brenner in the 1960s. For arbitrary separation distances, the low Reynolds number problem has a solution that's given in terms of a, a complicated eigenfunction expansion. And in the lubrication limit, the solution is known analytically. So you, because, the, because we're mostly interested in the drift, it's the sphere normal to a rigid plane. That is, is given in research papers and books. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Okay, there is a question from Alejandro also. That, can... Alejandro, have you considered the effect of viscoelastic fluids for the edge three variable problem? That is a great question. Uh, you're the second or third person that sort of asked me that. Um, we haven't tried to look at it in detail. Um, you know, they're very common models in the thin film world. You know, use power law models and things like that. They're very nice models. They have a, sort of the flaw that they don't properly represent um, either, I forget, it, whether it's the free surface flow or the flow at the wall. So they're sort of approximate, whereas I'd rather do something that 
tries to get the flow field about right. Um, we haven't looked in detail in that, but that is a very good question. Um, it's not obvious to me uh, if this complete similarity will hold. It would probably hold for you know, simple models like uh, power law models. But I think it's a really nice question, and we certainly have not done experiments of that type. But that would probably be an interesting thing to do as well. I mean, the experiments were a microscope slide and then uh, just de quickly depositing liquid uh, you, uh, on the, the film. Right. OK. OK, let's, let's go to the next question by Marcelo Berli. Uh, OK, now it's, uh, thank you. It's just, it's just, it's just thanking you. Um, and there is a question here by Victor. The film was normal fluid. It will be interesting to uh, double or to to do the experiment uh, with some complex uh, liquid, uh, for example, but with bacteria. He's saying. I don't know. That's his comment. Yeah, I th that might. Well, except for the bacteria, that might be similar. If he's thinking about the thin film flow problem to uh, Alejandro Gonzalez's nice observation about trying to think about more complex fluids. Um, I, I should say that the, uh, the feature that I spent a lot of time thinking about and even bothered a few of my friends to help me um, was, was it, was it the edge that's most special? And are there other problems when you input an edge that you might have this boundary layer like structure? It's essentially like a boundary layer problem. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it, I, I think it's very nice. Uh, they're all good observations. Okay. Uh, I don't think uh, is there any other. We have time for some other questions from from the audience. Uh, Victor raised hands again, but I don't know if he's going to. Oh, he's not. It looks like he's on his mobile. Mobile. Yeah. I don't, it seems that his microphone is not working. Uh, I had a question. I was curious about the, this uh, self similar formulation and more than one problems that involve three variables. So it looks like a, a generalization that you can do in that problem that uh, if you have more more variables, uh, because it looks like uh, the, there is some kind of recipe that you can get from that that you can decompose the variable, the dependent variable is as a function of time, usually a power law, and then a, the usual psi variable x over t with some powers, and then there is there is this combination x, y, and t, and then you, you, you should go on like a factorization of the solution. Is that the way you think of that? Because I look at it like a factorization. So you have something dependent on time, something times something that depends on x and time and then times another function that depends on x y and time that's kind of a generalization you can think of it um i'm not i'm trying to share my screen again i'm not quite sure if, if i understood well i don't know it's something that uh, came to my mind when i saw your some of you your might be right I, I i think uh, can you see the screen yeah 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 it's, it's, I can see yeah, it now. The, the feature is if you think about the Jeffrey solution as the uniform film in the middle, and you think about the edge as a boundary layer and only keep the largest contribution from surface tension, then I think you are right. In, in some sense, the, the film height H, which is trying to be whatever the Jeffrey solution is in the middle, you have some freedom in the scale you choose for Y Mm -hmm. to balance the first and third terms. And that, miraculously, you can do for the case where you have a, a power law outer region, which is like the free film. Yeah. I think there are other generalizations of this uh, in the boundary layer sense. How, how much more general it would be if you went back to the, you know, what you think of as the normal thin film equation that many people study. I don't know, but uh, what I do know is in the case that we looked at, the surface tension term looks like a boundary layer that I'm circling. And that allows you to sort of fix up the, at least one self-similar problem in two dimensions and make it apply to three. 
Mm -hmm. I've, I've tried to think about this generally. Uh, one or two people have given me advice to think about the differential equation using the concepts of group theory. Um, I would like to do that, except I don't know group theory, so that doesn't go very far with me, but I think it sounds like a very powerful thing to do, and if people hadn't done it in the thin film world, which as far as I can, they tell yeah. they haven't done it, there might be other things to do uh, trying to take these situations that lead to simplified but higher order uh, PDEs and multiple variables. So I think you're saying something that is very rational and true. Um, how general it is, I, I'd be curious. I think it's a great question. It would be nice to look for some other problems to see. Victor, yes. you, you, can, there are some, uh, you can speak now. Uh, we cannot hear you. you I can see you, but I cannot hear you. I think he logged in uh, as a listener on only. Ah, uh, he has yes, yes. He he logged on as a to as a listener. Out so he, and log in again. I think he muted himself uh, for the for the. <coughs> Okay, so um, the only thing I can say now is that uh, thank you very much, Howard, for this uh, very interesting talk. I'm very um, uh, proposing some very challenging problems that you have been working on, and uh, but uh, gives idea and uh, inspiration for uh, to people. I hope so to for to continue with the with this uh, this line of work and this line of thinking. But there are a lot of new thinkings in your problems. That's uh, what I like. Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I'm going to stay online for a, a while to listen to the next couple of talks, okay. if that's okay, and then I'll go teach. I, I think okay. The okay. okay. Thank you very much. Hear me now. Okay. Okay. We, so we are done with the session. Okay. <laughs>